Lewis structures are a great way of representing the bonding. It lets us know what types of bonds, single, double, and triple. It lets us know which atoms are bonded to which other atoms. It lets us know which elements have lone pairs on them. But it is a flat 2D picture of something that in reality is three-dimensional. So to understand what molecules really do as they react and as they interact with one another, we need a three-dimensional picture. That's where the valence shell electron pair repulsion or VSEPR theory comes in. It's very simple in terms of understanding what it's saying and what it's doing. It says that electrons pairs in the valence shell repel one another. When we do this, we're looking at any atom in the center of a Lewis structure and how many places it has electrons. It may have lone pairs around it. Well, those lone pairs want to be as far as possible away from other lone pairs. It may be bonded to an atom. The electrons in that bond want to be as far away as the, from the electrons in any other bonds. That means that those molecules, rather than just being a nice flat picture like this on a piece of paper, actually take a three-dimensional shape. There's a really good simulation that PHET shapes that can show you these things in three dimensions if you want to manipulate them and play with them. And we'll even probably pull that up in class a little bit. But what we want to be able to do is to envision and to connect these to a name that we have that describes each of those shapes. If right there, I've got a central atom with two things on it, there's some electrons here and some electrons there, that's what these red balloons are representing, the electron clouds that want to be as far away from each other as possible. Well, that makes my atoms connect or line up in a straight line. If I have more electrons, if I have electrons in one, two, three places, it can no longer be here and there or 180 degrees apart. It ends up spreading out in a triangle. It's still a flat triangle, and that's called trigonal planar. When there is a fourth thing on my central atom, then those four things spread out as far from one another as possible. One, two, three, four. Four is tetra. So we have a tetrahedral shape, or we've got this three-dimensional triangle. Once we go to expanded octets, either with extra atoms, extra lone pairs, then we would need to put those extra electrons either as far away as possible. When we have a fifth or a sixth, we go to shapes that we call trigonal bipyramidal, like it's two pyramids put together, or octahedral, because this shape, even though it's only six things bonded to a central atom, would be a shape with eight faces. So there are five basic shapes or five electron geometries. If I've got two, three, four, five, or six things on my central atom, we won't really talk about seven things because that's so rare and in practical purposes impossible to do. And if I just have two atoms bonded, those by definition have to be linear. When we do this with Vesper, we would treat them as if whether it's a single bond or a double bond, whether it's a lone pair or a bond, that all electrons repel one another, which they do. We also treat it as if all electrons repel each other perfectly equally, which they don't. Electrons in bonds repel other electrons in bonds similarly. Single bonds repel another single bond totally equally. But when we have a double or triple bond, there is extra electrons there, either four or six compared to the two. So those six negative electrons would likely repel a single bond a little bit more. That could slightly change our bond angles or our shapes. When we have a lone pair instead of a bond, in a bond, those electrons are being pulled and shared between the two atoms. In a lone pair, they're just kind of sitting there on that one atom. So right here, an example of an ideal tetrahedral compared to what happens if one of the four regions was a lone pair. That lone pair has extra repulsive power. We don't need to know the exact angles or the exact way that this can happen, just to know that lone pairs repel a little bit better. That pushes our other things closer together. It'd be like putting an extra large balloon right here. So a double bond would be like an extra large balloon. 
a lone pair would be like an extra large balloon that would just force the others to be a little bit closer together. The bond angles listed here, we should be familiar with, especially these first three, but we don't have to memorize them down to the nearest tenth. We just have to be able to kind of estimate them. And the 180 and 120 should be very easy, splitting in half or splitting a circle in thirds. The 109.5 is a little bit more tricky, but possible to remember. And often they'll let you call that anything from like 105 to 115. So if we think of it as 110, we're usually good enough or we get close enough to get any points. The reason that this is impossible or possible and important, that's what I was trying to say, is that this tells us much more than a Lewis structure can. It helps us to describe the bond angle. How close are these atoms actually together? It helps us to know about bond energies. Along with a Lewis structure, the shape can add a little bit more to that bond order and the strength. The bond length, which is very well described by Lewis structures, Vesper helps us to see how that looks different. And most importantly, this three-dimensional shape helps us to know whether molecules and bonds are polar or nonpolar. So we put all of this together, and then we're able to have a complete picture of the properties of something. The Lewis structure tells us a lot, and adding Vesper to that tells us even more. With the Vesper, it is important to recognize that those five electron geometries really can result in extra shapes for a molecule. When I have something like CH4, that's a perfect tetrahedral. Four bonds on my central atom, all four electron regions are exactly equivalent to one another, and my molecule is a tetrahedral. When I have ammonia, NH3, I still have electrons in four places, one, two, three, four. But one of those is a lone pair. If I was going to look at ammonia molecule, I wouldn't actually see those electrons on top, but they would have an effect. They would make the molecule kind of shape like a triangle-shaped pyramid. So we call this molecule not tetrahedral, but trigonal pyramidal. The electron geometry is important, but we kind of ignore that to focus on molecular geometry. Water we don't think of as having four things on it often. We think of a oxygen with a hydrogen and a hydrogen, but we also often see that drawn kind of like a Mickey Mouse rather than a straight line. The reason for that is the electrons here and here still take up space and still repel, causing instead of a straight line, the molecule to be bent. So the molecular geometry is much more important. In fact, we'll highlight that and leave that highlighted here in the notes, more important than the electron geometry because we can't see the lone pairs, even though they do change the shape and slightly change the bond angle, they are not a part of the molecule in terms of its structure. Sometimes, and we will practice this, you might have more than one interior or central atom. In that case, we would just look on each atom, how many bonds and how many lone pairs are there? All of these have four things, but we're really classifying them by how many bonds and how many lone pairs. When I have three bonds with no lone pairs, that makes a flat triangle. That is a perfect trigonal planar. But if I have two bonds with the lone pair, that slightly changes the shape, making it bent bent with a different structure than water, but still bent. Only when I have two bonds and no lone pairs on it do I end up with that straight line. So as we look at this, we do have to memorize some of these things. This is the chart of the ones worth memorizing, and then we'll go to a complete chart that is the ones worth being familiar with. Some things to note is we're really focusing mostly on the bonding region, and the molecular geometry. If there's four bonds, that's tetrahedral. Three bonds is some version of trigonal. Three bonds with the lone pair is trigonal pyramidal. It gets that kind of pyramid shape. Three bonds, but no lone pairs can be a flat triangle. Two bonds with any lone pairs is bent. 
whereas two bonds with no loan pairs is linear. This is a great resource to have, to print, to save, even to take to college with you, um, is all of our shapes summarized. So we've got those same shapes we just looked at with an example, with a Lewis structure, with some bond angles, and even with some hybridizations that we'll see in the next few videos. But then it also shows us how trigonal bipyramidal and octahedral, those are our main shapes, could look a little bit different if we replace some of our bonds with lone pairs. Be familiar with these, but it's not really worth our time to memorize perfectly every single structure. If we know the ones up here, that gets us through most of the molecules, whether small or large, and then every now and then you'll find an exception as well.